um, special council meeting. Um, it must be June 7th, my God, uh, <laughs> of June 7th, 2007, to order. Will you please stand to say the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to the flag of, of the United, United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice, justice for all. Will you please call the roll? Councilmember Barnwell? Here. Falcone? Here. Horton? Absent? House? Here. Schneider? Williams? Here. Mayor Bloom? Here. Okay. Uh, is, do you have any public comment slips? Nothing. Okay, then let's go to item one. Item number one, budget public hearing and work session. Okay. We're going to start, I think, with community. Oh, we'll start with Mr. Pearson. Go ahead. Good morning, Madam Mayor, members of Council, Bob Pearson, Finance Director. And yes, today is June 7th, and that means that it is the last public hearing and work session on the two-year financial plan for the next two fiscal years and the budget operating and capital for fiscal year 08. And we'll begin this morning with a presentation on the Community Development Department budget. If you recall, we rescheduled that department due to a lack of time at a previous budget work session. We'll begin with that and follow it up with a brief presentation on the Community Promotion Budget. And then I will be back to present to the Council the recommendations from the Finance Committee and uh, begin the Council discussion on, on the Finance Committee's recommendations and uh, any other recommendations the Council may have for staff um, regarding um, amendments to the recommended budget. Upon the conclusion of today's work session and public hearing, the finance staff will go back and prepare the budget adoption package and be back before you on Tuesday, June 26th for adoption of the two-year financial plan and the budget. And with that, I will turn it over to the Community Development Department and Paul Casey. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Casey. Good morning, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Uh, we are here to present the Community Development Department budget, which includes not only the general fund, but also the housing and redevelopment uh, section of the department. What we'll do today, as you recall, last week we covered the RDA grant process, and so we took care of a, of a decent chunk of what our uh, department presentation was going to be. So today we'll focus more on just the, the traditional budget side of things. Uh, Michelle DeCant, our administrative analyst, who really puts together the department's budget and does a great job, will make the general fund presentation. We'll talk a little bit about the Plan Santa Barbara effort from a budgeting standpoint. Uh, Mr. Gustafson will talk about redevelopment and the housing budget as well as the community development block grant efforts. And then I'll wrap up with some uh, performance measurement issues as well as kind of major department highlights and workload efforts, and then we'll be happy to answer any questions. So okay. at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. DeCant. Okay, Ms. DeCant. Thank you, Mr. Park Casey. My name is Michelle DeCant, the Administrative Analyst with the Community Development Department, and I am going to go over a department interview uh, or overview. That's where I'm going to start. We have 88 employees, and that has stayed steady for a number of years. And although I'm going to discuss a new position that we're going to be proposing, because we're able to delete a position, we've stayed steady with zero net increase of employees. We have four divisions. And in the past, we've always had 14 P3 programs, but this year, we're actually bringing over the Arts Advisory Program. You generally see that in the non-departmental portion of the budget, but since community development staff, including RDA, are the people that, that work with the Arts Advisory and oversee that program, we decided to bring that budget into community development. This is just a quick org chart of our department to show the four divisions as well as you can see we do have the arts program now and our economic development program. And now I'm going to go into the numbers of the general fund. On our revenues, we're at about $11 million of revenues. The majority of those are from our fees and service charges, which are generally the building and safety fees and the planning fees. Then we have our general fund subsidies. We do have the inner fund reimbursements, which is just the payback from the RDA and RDA housing salaries. They reimburse the general fund. We have a small amount for the admin citation program, and that's not a revenue generating program. It's really a more of a compliance abatement type of program, and so we don't look at a lot of revenue for that program. And then we do have some overhead allocation costs or revenues. On the expenditure side, as you can imagine, um, we're probably like most general funds. The majority of our costs are in the salary and benefits area. We do have other expenses, our supplies and equipment. 
And as you can see there, we did include the human services program and the grants, which are part of the general fund, as well as the arts budget. The three big areas that we want to talk about is bringing over the arts advisory program, this new proposed position, the senior planner, at a senior planner level, and it would be a training officer, staff hearing officer position. I'm going to talk a little bit more detail later. And we were able to keep it at, a, again, a zero net new because we were able to eliminate one position in our records program. And then we want to talk about a new fee that we're looking at, and we're calling it the LDT recovery fee. And I'll go into more detail with that, and it's actually a planning fee. On the arts advisory, their budget is about $571,000. The first four bullets are their funding areas where they, they do their grants, and their administrative costs are about $113,000. We did receive a request this year for an additional $36,552. That request was twofold. One is the three positions for the City Arts Advisory are not at 100%, and so we received a request to try to get their position up to 100%, and that would be matched by the County of Santa Barbara as well. The Parks and Rec Department of the County has recommended approval of this, and we believe the County Board of Supervisors will approve it as well. The rest of the cost is to make our City Hall Art Gallery official, and we, this would be run similar to the Channing Peak Gallery. There is a one-time cost to just uh, do some wall treatments and lighting and things of about $6,600. And then we were proposing two, recommenda two exhibits in the f for both the years. And I just put this up there, which you're going to hear more detail later, but the Finance Committee did make a recommendation to approve for the staff cost and to get the City Hall Art Gallery up and running, but not um, fund right now at the exhibits. And that would just mean that they'd have to go out and find some private funding for those. This is the Planning Division Organizational Chart. And I know it's hard to read, but the reason I put this up here is I wanted to show the new position. And as you can see, we have a new position, a new section. It's the Training and the Staff Hearing Officer section, what we call show. The position that we're proposing is a senior planner two level. And the big part that this position would be working on is the training. And this is to help meet the current demands of the planning division to address our recruitment and our retention needs. We hear this in our exit interviews that training is an area that we could do much better on. This position would also be working as our show, which is a staff hearing officer. And as you recall, I believe a couple months ago, City Planner Betty Weiss brought you the first annual update of the show process. When that program was developed, it was never intended that the City Planner would be the show in perpetuity. But we also knew that we wanted a position that was going to be a high-level position. A Senior Planner level is appropriate for that. The other good thing about this position is you can see we have a number of Senior Planner positions. It allows for growth opportunities within the division for cross-training, lateral reassignments, gives us a little bit more flexibility within our staff. Now I'm going to go on to the fee program for community development. We have three types of fees, planning, land development team, and building and safety. The planning fees support planning, and part of our fees actually support transportation planning of public works. Some of our fees are closer to full cost recovery, such as our ZIRs and our mailing labels. And as you know, some are extremely low. For example, our sign fees are low, and as you know, the appeal fees are incredibly low. So we are continuing, continuing to try to decrease the general fund subsidy. We are proposing across the board about a 10% increase to our fees. The second category of fees, we have our land development team fees. These support three different division or departments, public works, two areas, transportation planning and engineering, community development, and then for fire and their prevention. A number, and you've seen this chart before, a chart very similar. A number of years ago, we did do a fee study, and we saw that our fees were recovering only 8.65%. That was much lower than we actually thought. We were thinking we were in about the 20% range. At that time, City Council did give us a policy direction to increase our fees. We knew it would take a couple of years to get there to get to about a 30% recovery level. We've done some major fee increases over the last few years, 
And in 2007, this year, we actually feel that we were meeting that 30 percent. We, in actuality, we're a little bit off on that target with the slight decline of activity that we've seen, and I know you've heard that from the Finance Department uh, in the past. But we are proposing this new fee. I'm going to go into detail in just a second. And we're thinking we're going to get to about a 33% recovery level. So let me talk about that new fee. It's a planning fee. And it would be levied at the time of the building permit application. So it's after the complete planning process. This is when an applicant has more project certainty. They've gone through all of the boards. They've gone through the appeal process. And now they're ready to pull their building permit. Uh, they're starting to get their financing in line. We've talked with other developers. They felt this was an appropriate fee. They uh, felt that it was fair at this time because they have certainty that their project's going to go forward at this point. Based on our analysis, we believe about 70% of the projects that start in the planning, planning process end up at the building permit stage. And just to give you an example, of how much this would cost if at the beginning of a planning process they pay $7,500 in fees. At the time when they go to build their building permit, we would be assessing an extra $2,250, and that's strictly a planning fee, and it's just to help reduce the general fund level because, as you can see, we're you know, just at that 30 33% level. For fiscal year 2008, we are expecting about $121,000 in revenue. And again, it's really it's a fee to help us reduce that general fund subsidy. And also staff at this time, as you can see in the yellow down there, this may be the appropriate time to relook at the, our 30 percent policy and do we want to raise that and perhaps get us up to a 50 percent recovery level. And again, it will take you know substantial fee increases and it will take multiple years, but it may be an appropriate time to look at this. The next couple charts that I have are charts that Council has requested. You've seen these before. They're comparison charts. And it's sometimes hard to compare because some of these jurisdictions are on deposit, some are at full cost, some aren't at full cost. But this particular, or the next two charts, are planning activities. This particular one is just to show with our 10% fee increase what our proposed fees would be and how we compare to some other jurisdictions. As you can see, we're on the higher end. We're definitely not on the low end, but we are on the high end and in the middle range of most fees. This particular chart is looking just at our exact neighbors, Carpinteria, the county, and Goleta. And it should be noted that all three of those categories, those numbers you see are strictly deposits. So we know the full cost is actually more. And those jurisdictions are at full cost recovery. Pardon me? Well, the deposit system works and is where when you apply for a tentative subdivision map, they pay a certain amount of money, and then the planner keeps t track of their time throughout the whole process. And, they're con and they pay, they, the deposit gets down to zero, and then they start billing the applicant for this time. It's a very cumbersome type of process, but it, the county said these jurisdictions are at that type of process. Madam Mayor, may I ask a question? Mr. Well, Mr. Williams had oh, a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Burn. Well, yeah. I, just, I just wanted to make sure be, that, that um, all the council and audience knew, though, that it's really hard to compare these because some of those jurisdictions have impact fees, and, and so that means their to total fees are, high, are higher, um, but it's hard to reflect that by category. Yes. Is that the next slide, Mr. Casey? <laughs> <laughs> Madam Mayor and uh, yeah. Madam Mayor and Councilmember Williams, I do have two more slides that are coming, and it's going to show exactly that. Okay. So, building and safety fees is the third area of our fees. Again, these support the building and safety functions. These have been historically closer to the full cost. We are proposing a nine percent increase to these fees, and it's strictly just to keep us at that full cost recovery level. And then the past couple years, we've heard where is the slowdown in our, in our land development team process. And part of the area that we've heard is in our plan check turnaround time. A couple of years ago, you, the city council did authorize um, additional plan check staff, and it's been very successful. You can see our goal on the LDT matrix is 22 days, and we're actually exceeding that goal. 
uh, with the staff that we have. Here's the chart you've been waiting for. <laughs> this chart you've seen before. It's a sample project, a four lot subdivision, four new homes, 2,500 square feet. And as you can see, I've laid out a number of the fees and the city of Santa Barbara is, even though we have these fee increases, we're still incredibly low. We don't have impact fees. Paul Casey will be discussing that towards the end of this presentation. I did show the new LDT recovery fee on this chart. We have a technology fee and we have a general management growth general plan update fee, which I'm going to point out a little bit later what that fee does and how much <coughs> revenue we've received from that. This chart is another sample chart similar to the one before. The Home Builders Association does a full cost uh, comprehensive study about two times a, about every two years. I have the study and I believe I made copies for the council when this came out. And I pulled this information strictly from this study. It takes them almost a year, if not a little bit more, to get all the information from the various jurisdictions because this may look very simple, but when you look at the footnotes trying to compare a project, there's about 47 different footnotes because there's so many variances of each project in each jurisdiction. And so it's very hard to really do a, a complete apples to apples. But this is theirs, and I wanted to share this with the council. We did take our budget to our boards and commissions. They were all very supportive of the new position. Matter of fact, they were so supportive, our boards and commissions would actually like some training for themselves. They were hoping that this new position might do some work for them. We do expect to receive a planning commission request, perhaps for some additional funding for their uh, training budget. They'd like to attend a conference, all of them at 100% cost at one time. All the boards and commissions, including the Finance Committee, were supportive of this new fee, as well as supportive of our general overall fee increases. Finance Committee, we did talk also about perhaps this is the time to look at do we want to uh, try to help the general fund subsidy and reduce that. And I believe it was an overall consensus that this is an appropriate time. As well, there is some discussion on the process improvements of reducing time. Time is money to us. Time is money to the developer. Staff is very w well aware of this, and we are working at always trying to prove the system. Now I want to talk briefly about the Plan Santa Barbara effort, just the budget portion of the effort, because this has been officially launched a week ago Wednesday, was the official kickoff for Plan Santa Barbara. So this is just the dollar side of the effort. When we came forward to City Council a number of years ago, it was about a $4.4 .4 million effort. Half of this is funded by the general fund, which is mostly staff salaries. The other half would be funded by a loan from the general fund. And that loan would be paid back by this growth management GPU fee, which is why I pointed that out on the previous slide. To date, we've received about $225,000. That's right on target to help pay back the general fund. That's right on target of what our estimates were be, would be. Plan Santa Barbara does have one full-time equivalent, equivalent. It's a limited term position that is set just for Plan Santa Barbara. And the balance of the effort comes from our long-range planning and special study section. And that's that general fund portion that's helping on this effort. There are a number of expenditures. As you can imagine, the consultants are the highest cost. We have three major areas. The public participation area, which we're currently under. The environmental review area, which we'll be going into shortly. And then the implementation area for consultants. And then there are miscellaneous costs of you know, advertising and printing and copying and that type of thing. And then I just put on the website there, www.uplansb.org. This is a great website. It has a ton of information. Hopefully all of you have been able to go on there and see what has already occurred, what's coming up, the dates of public meetings. It has a lot of information, and when you register with that website, as they make changes, it actually emails you so you know that there's new information out on the website. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Gustafson. Mr. Gustafson. Thank you, uh, Michelle. Thank you. 
Madam Mayor. Um, I'm actually going to cover for you the, uh, the overview of the whole Housing and Redevelopment Division budget. That's going to include the Redevelopment Agency's General Fund, uh, the Housing Fund for the Redevelopment Agency, our capital projects, and at that point I might bring Brian up to augment some of our information, um, and then the Community Development Block Grant Fund with just a peripheral touch on human services. And I wanted you to re recollect that uh, redevelopment law on the on the agency budget requires a public hearing, and that public hearing is by the discretionary body, which is you sitting as a city council. So this is kind of the sequel to the public hearing that we started last week when we did the capital grant, uh, the community grants, and this is the rest of it. So this does constitute our legally required public hearing. Um, I'll go to uh, the the brief background of the redevelopment agency uh, that you've heard a lot of times, but for the general public and for you once again. The boundaries of the redevelopment project incorporate the uh, downtown and the waterfront. On the north, you can see the boundaries of Victoria Street. And on the uh, west, it comes down Highway 101 and Castillo, Castillo Street to the harbor and goes and includes the whole harbor and marina area. Comes back through the water, includes uh, Stearns Wharf. And when it hits the beach, um, it excludes a portion of the Old Chase Palm Park. I'm not sure entirely why. Well, we could do a historical research on that, but it runs down Cabrillo Boulevard to Milpas and then up Milpas to the freeway and then back uh, going west to Santa Barbara Street. So the eastern boundary of most of the project area, at least the downtown portion, is Santa Barbara Street. Uh, in terms of background, the project's one of the oldest redevelopment project areas in the state. It was uh, initiated in 1972. It was actually activated, and we started collecting tax increment in 1977. Uh, that would give us a life of 40 years, but because of the ERAF situation over the last three years, we've gained another two or three years there. So we're currently scheduled, unless there's some new ERAF that we have to confront <laughs> in additional years, uh, to expire in 2015. Uh, we can collect tax increment for 10 years after the expiration date, which is 2025, uh, if we have existing debt. The problem with that is that there's a cap on our ability to collect tax increment. It's a dollar cap. It's in the original plan. It's extremely difficult for any project area to change and impossible for us based on the degree of blight we have left. Uh, so what our projections when we did our bond issues a few years ago was that we would probably reach that cap of $431 million around 2018. So that's a constraining factor for us. If, if we wanted to issue new debt, we can't issue new general fund debt anyway because we passed a statutory deadline for that. We could consider issuing new housing debt, but then we're constrained by this cap on total tax increment. Um, first, I'll talk about the agency's general fund. That's uh, comprised of tax, tax increment and loan and investment income. In terms of projections, we conservatively every year estimate between 3 and 4 percent in tax increment growth, and you can see that uh, it's been significantly above that. Uh, so we're proposing in 2008, or we've predicated our budget on 5 percent, which would yield us uh, $17,325,000 in tax increment. And right off the top, or in case of, in case of this chart, I guess right off the bottom, 20% uh, is taken off for affordable housing, so that's three point, almost $3.5 million. And you can see in this existing fiscal year that uh, we expect to end up with about an 8% tax increment growth, and we budgeted, I believe, at 4%. Uh, in terms of revenues for the agency's general fund, it's comprised of tax increment, uh, use of reserves, loan and rents, and interest income. Uh, the tax increment figure that you see there, which is 13.8, uh, is the um, total tax increment estimated less the 20% that we took off for affordable housing. Uh, in use of reserves, uh, that's comprised of surpluses over what was budgeted last fiscal year in tax increment, interest income, and any project surpluses. And then rental income is $48,000, and that's really from our one uh, lease that we have, which is open-air bicycle down at the REA building at the, at the train depot. And uh, loan program income is estimated to be $5,000, and that's really from one loan that we did that was associated with a commercial space when we built uh, the Lot 10 parking structure. On the expenditure side, 
uh, the biggest chunk out of expenditures for the upcoming fiscal year will be paying back those bonds we did in 2001 and 2003. We issued a total of almost $78 million. Uh, part of the strategy there was to create funding for capital projects before that limit on being able to incur debt uh, uh, affected us, which was in 2003. So. The special expenses up at the top there, which is $608,500, that's comprised of $300,000 for the shuttle bus contracts, which is part of our mitigation for our, our development activities downtown. Um, 175000 of that is for property management. We have a number of properties owned by the agency, and that's just to take care of them on an annual basis. 75000 is a fund for hazardous materials. Uh, testing and any remediation that we might have to do. Uh, and then 58,500 5, 58, of that is for the downtown organization as a grant we give them every year to promote the historic and cultural district. Uh, they do the brochure for that district, which is very effective, and a number of, num number of other activities there. Uh, we maintain an operating reserve of $80,000. And then, if you'll recall back in February at McKenzie Park, and we talked about this last week at the community grants discussion, you decided to set aside $1 million for community grants and preserve the rest of our surplus for a contingency account for uh, capital projects that we're currently pursuing because we're seeing all these cost increases. Uh, it, uh, the decision you made was $1 million for community grants and then $5.7 million for the uh, contingency account. Uh, which is labeled up there as available. In actuality, since that time, uh, you granted a, uh, you approved a $500,000 three-year bridge loan to the Trust for Historic Preservation to buy Jimmy's Oriental Gardens. So that came out of that 5.7. So we now have 5.2. And actually, I think uh, at, at last Friday's uh, work session on the community grants, you even uh, saved a little bit of that $1 million uh, after giving a little bit of money to the historic, uh, to the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, which I think was $3,600. There's probably about another slightly less than $30,000 that will flow to that contingency account. Okay, and then the agency's housing fund. Um, this is used to develop and preserve affordable housing. Uh, it's tax increment, which is a 20% set aside, and then loan income we derive from the loans we make and investment income. In terms of revenues, we carry, o carry over to this chart the uh, almost $3.5 million, which is the 20% of the projected tax increment for fiscal year 2008. Uh, we, we have loan repayments for loans that are outstanding. We estimate at $160,000. Uh, that's not a lot of money for all the loans that we have outstanding, but you have to recognize, as I know you do, that a lot of those loans are very favorable residual receipts types loans because that's the only way that we can make uh, affordable housing uh, projects practical in the community. And by residual receipts, what I mean is we grant the loan, uh, we allow the owner of the property to take out uh, operating expenses, other debt service, and a couple of other items. And then if there's any balance left over, if they have a positive, they're required to start paying back our loan. So it's a small amount, but it gives us a, a lever to keep control of those projects. And if there is any kind of windfall, if there's some way that could possibly happen, it'd be great. Then we'd get more money paid back. And then we in earn interest on those outstanding loans of about $200,000 a year. On the expenditure side, um, the, we'll take first the pieces of the pie that carve out what our obligations are, and we'll show you what's left. Uh, debt service is the biggest piece that we're obligated for. That's 643500 That's the loan that, that's the, the bond that we issued for the St. Vincent Senior Project in order to complete the funding for that. And if you've driven by there lately, you'll see that it's about ready to, be occupied, so we're very excited about that. Uh, operating expenses are about 20% in the housing program, and our operating reserves, again, we, we, uh, we maintain $80,000. What that leaves you is $2.3 million available for future projects, but don't stop there. There's more to that story, so we'll go on to the next slide. 
uh, total agency funds that are available for housing includes that $2.3 million on the top line, and then we have approximately $5 million in uh, reserves in the agency's fund 112. And I've also thrown in there, just for your information, two uh, funds that appear in our capital program, which is the housing contingency fund, where back in 2005 you set aside $2 million to work on housing projects. There's $1.5 million left there. We spent $200,000 on um, enabling the uh, sobering center in the Falling Hotel and an another $250,000 on soil remediation for the Casas Las Granadas project, which is the people's self-help housing project up at, uh, at the new parking structure across from the library. So that has a balance of $1.55 million. And then uh, you also set aside uh, a portion of our bond fund for opportunity acquisition, specifically for housing acquisition. It was uh, about $2.3 million. We uh, used $2 million of that to uh, give an acquisition loan to the housing authority for the, hot, the Hagen property uh, on Coda Street, which will be developed uh, hopefully in the near future as an affordable housing project. And then in addition to that, we have home funds and CDBG funds that are available. So uh, the bottom line, if you count those two existing accounts and then our reserves and what we expect to get in 2008, may look like a lot of money to you. I would suggest it's not an embarrassment of riches. Uh, there's going to be a, a great load on spending that money when you just do the math and figure that it takes a good $100,000, <coughs> pardon me, a unit just to uh, subsidize affordable housing. So if you did 100 units, there's $10 million. So it can go fast, and we'll go on to the next slide, which will show you how, how we think it might go fairly quickly in the next uh, one- to two-year period. The transit village uh, at uh, Chapala in Korea, Korea. Uh, you set aside $2 million for the housing portion of that back in 2005 when we restructured our capital program. What did I say? Two, $2 million? I hope I said that right. Uh, you set aside $2 million for that. You, in last year's RDA budget, you set aside another million, so there's $3 million sitting there. Uh, we're not proposing formally in the budget. You don't see it in your document because it's a bit premature, but we're suggesting that uh, uh, the staff intends to, uh, at some point, reserve $2 million of the money that's available for uh, the additional costs that might be associated with subsidizing the housing in the, uh, in the transit village. Uh, it's premature sure to tell you just how we're bringing that project back to you from its trip away from you back to the uh, Planning Commission and the HLC and the Downtown Parking Committee and the Transportation and Circulation Committee and a public meeting, and so we're going to bring you back what we heard there and see if we can't at the same time provide you with a RFP that could be issued that you'd be comfortable with for a developer to do the project. So $2 million there. There's a project on the West Downtown, the next two projects, West Downtown and East Side. Difficult to sort of talk about in public because they're pending real estate deals. I think that they're very substantial deals. I think they're potentially very real. Uh, they involve nonprofit housing developers, and, and at least in one case, the participation of the potential participation of the redevelopment aid, of the I'm sorry of the housing authority. Uh, both of those projects combined would be aimed. Uh, substantially at the supportive housing that's called for in the 10-year plan to end chronic homelessness. Uh, together, the units that could be realized could be as much as 140, 150 units. So, you know, again, you can do the math and see how quickly this uh, pot of money we have will, will disappear. And then uh, Hagen Printing, you provided the $2 million loan to acquire the property, but when you did that, uh, we advised you that uh, it would probably take about $4.7 million in total subsidies. So at some point when the project was defined, the Housing Authority would be, act, be back asking for as much as $2.7 million to $3 million for the rest of the subsidy. And the Housing Authority, in fact, had, the last time I checked, issued an RFP for an architect. I'm sure they perfected that, and so conceptual plans are going forward. So that kind of looks, uh, that's where the money would go, uh, and, uh, and it's, in some ways, it seems like a lot compared to agencies that don't have the ability to significantly fund affordable housing, but in another way, it can go very quickly on projects at the cost that we experience. This is the RDA capital program. Uh, the current capital, and program, current capital program includes 21 capital projects valued at $36.8 million, nine community grants at $2.9 million, and almost uh, $40 million in total. The funding sources are the, the capital fund, which is uh, 
is the money that we receive from the tax increment into our general fund 111 that we transfer then to 311, which is our capital fund. But the source of it is the tax increment. Uh, and then our 2001 and 2003 bonds, which as I indicated to you, uh, total almost uh, $78 million. Well, we weren't, weren't planning today to go through all of the capital projects and, and their status. We highlighted some here that you can you can read that I think are some of the most significant ones. If you have any questions about the status of any of them, I'll do my best and we'll bring Brian up to help and we'll tell you what the current status is. Uh, funds available to appropriate. Um, this is again just a review that we probably don't need to spend a lot of time on because it was supposed to be before you decided about the community grants, right? Mm -hmm. We got out of sequence because of the time, Sorry. but the, I've already uh, discussed it with you. Com community grants at a million and you held it a little less than that. And then uh, project contingency account is uh, 5.2 after you subtract the funds for the, mm -hmm. for the trust project. Community development block grant. Always a struggle because we never know what we're gonna get because the federal government fools with it every year. Um, we do receive those federal funds from the Department of Housing and Urban Development and their primary goal is to develop a viable urban community by providing decent housing and suitable living environment for low income folks. Uh, funding categories that we can use are uh, public service, uh, capital and administration and fair housing. Uh, the revenues that we expected uh, have been changed a little bit. They'll be adjusted downward by staff action to account for a federal reduction that we didn't exactly anticipate entirely the, the entire amount. I think we had a reduction of like a little less than $8,000 based on what all the legislative predict predictions were when we went to budget. So the new entitlement amount is actually $1,106,707 and the total revi revised amount is 1,456,707. And then we'll also have an additional $104,000 of reprogram money, unused funds from prior years, which are not reflected in the budget, but are available to be considered for uh, budgeting and appropriating during the year. On the expenditure side, um, again, the, the $7,767, which was the amount that HUD reduced us, uh, will uh, come out of the uh, uh, capital grants account. Uh, capital grants uh, constitute about a million dollars. Uh, public services, which is that whole process we go every uh, go through every year, along with human services to fund social service agencies, is at one hundred and sixty-six thousand uh, dollars. Fair housing, which we do administratively from our division, uh, funded at one hundred and fifty-two thousand, and then our administrative load, which is nine percent, is at one hundred and thirty-eight thousand. Um, the program, as I say, is challenged every year. Um, we'll all keep fighting the good fight to keep community development block grant uh, intact and hopefully increased. Uh, the uh, expectations are for 2009 that the federal administration is proposing or will propose a 20% reduction. As I say, we'll keep fighting for uh, maintaining what we have and you know, hopefully even potentially increasing that amount. And then I, as I said peripherally, I want to touch on human services funds. Uh, in the budget, you see a total of $647,821, and that complements the CDBG funding of those social service agencies. Um, the Community Development Human Services Committee had request a, requested a 12% increase in that amount just to keep up with inflation. This is when we were budgeting a 3% increase to take care of that. They had a subcommittee that, that felt that that wasn't adequate. It would take them many years to catch up. The Finance Committee at their last meeting uh, uh, considered this item and they approved an increase of 7% over the current year rather than the 3% that was showing in the budget. So. That concludes my presentation, and we'll go back to Paul. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Casey. Oh, we have a question, Mr. Barnwell? Um, is now the proper time for questions of the RDA, or do you want to wait till the end? Oh, for RDA? Should we go ahead? Go totally ahead. up to you. Mr. Gustafson? We yes. have a question from a couple, Mr. Yes. A couple of questions. <clears throat> um, what are the total dollars that we give to the downtown organization? We, we do the street clean thing, we do the promo stuff. How, how, what is the 
What are the various categories and what is the dollar amount? Do you have an idea of what that is? Uh, Mr. Brownwell, I, I don't, uh, all of it. We maybe collectively we could figure that out. I can tell you that we, as we, I indicated the 58500 for the promotion of right. the cultural and historic district. And then you just approved, uh, at this point at least, a one-off grant for the first Thursday activity in the community grants on Friday. And I'm not conversant with the rest of the funding that they get. Okay. I can, I can okay. tell you that we... Sure, I'm sure. <clears throat> The, in the Parks and Recreation budget, we have, and don't hold me to this, but I think around, around $650,000 that we basically contract with them to do the maintenance downtown, the steam, the, the steam cleaning of the sidewalks, all of the landscaping. And we are in discussions with them. We're probably going to have to supplement that because of uh, we're going to have to change our steam cleaning process to avoid runoff into the uh, storm drain. So there's, we're oh. going to have to do something there. But it, it's around 650, as I recall. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, not meaning to be too specific, but knowing no way to avoid it, um, on the the turtle pond <clears throat> down behind the um, sewer treatment plant which is, I believe, in the RDA area. Is there, is that, I, I don't ever, I don't ever see that, but I wonder if, the, is there any RDA money going to that, or is that coming from some other completely different pot? I guess it's, um, perhaps seek a little more definition by the turtle pond. Do you, do it's you a, mean the, the turtle pond itself Casey or the knows, property that we bought that was a, uh, adjacent? Well, we did buy the property, and then we, we scraped it and inappropriately Ah. scraped it, and we have costs associated with rehabilitating it, and I just wondered, Mr. Casey? Mr. Madam Mayor, Councilmember Barnwell, I think the, 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 the turtle pond that you might be thinking about was purchased by the Public Works Department, I think the wastewater fund, because at the time of purchase, uh, it was considered possible ex expansion of the Yellowstero wastewater treatment plant. Uh, and so the, the dollars to remediate that issue is coming out of the wastewater fund, not redevelopment agency. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. And all right, thank you. <coughs> okay, Mr. Uh, House, do you have a question? Mm -hmm. uh, two things. One, um, you, you use the words fight the good fight. Um, I suppose you mean in attempting to, to, to send a message of the value of the Community Development Block Grant funding uh, to those who could make a difference and, and head off this proposal or possible proposal for a 20% reduction, maybe even see the increase. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, yes, uh, Councilman House, that's exactly what I mean. All the, the lobbying efforts to try to uh, forestall those reductions and the uh, Congress of Mayors, League of California Cities, uh, every almost every city you can imagine uh, fights the fight to try to mm -hmm. preserve the funding in Congress, and we always participate in that. I'll just interject a comment. What in the world are they thinking? You know, <laughs> what in the world? If you look at the good that's done with that, just unbelievable. Um, so, but and this is this may be a question uh, for Mr. Wiley. Um, the uh, at what point do we be, talk about? Now it wouldn't we can't continue the RDA past 2015. We have the ability to do the, uh, we have the limitation on the amount of money that can be raised to pay debt, and we could continue to extend debt, but we'd be limited by how much we can pay back. Am I understanding that part of the process correctly? Yes. Mm -hmm. Then um, at what point in which group of us, the RDA board or the um, city council, can we begin to have conversations about the succession of it in terms of yeah. how we meet the need that we've been meeting through the redevelopment agency? Um, you know, wh what, which form is, is appropriate for that discussion, and when um, can we roll up our sleeves and begin to really engage in that? Yeah. Mr. Casey, <laughs> you know, we, we completely agree with you. Yeah, yeah everybody's nodding. House member House, and, and I think the time is getting near, and, and I think the forum is with you. Uh, to have that dialogue and as the redevelopment agency or as the, as the or city, city council, council as the city council I mean, we're going to have to try to find I think our professional opinion is that somehow you need to find some way to continue to maintain downtown downtown yeah. is a very important component to the city it's a major revenue generating source for the general fund and the redevelopment agency has been extremely successful in, in, in making it work and as those monies go away, where do we come up with the next batch of money to maintain the sidewalks and in 20 years, you know, refresh them again as you need to do to keep downtowns vibrant? And so I, that's something that I think we would lead as redevelopment and community development staff uh, with you as the council, with the downtown organization and with the business community because uh, we're going to need to find some revenue source because the other thing is that the redevelopment agency will expire and the ability to expend funds, but what the 
the revenue will continue to be paying down debt for a number of years. So it's not like there will be a new windfall of property tax coming to the city that we could just redirect right. immediately. That will be a few years before we see that. And uh, uh, Mayor Bloom and Council Member House, I I'd like to also add to that that um, we were just talking about uh, all the money that we have to pursue affordable housing, right. and it is from redevelopment sources uh, very predominantly. So it's a huge impact on the redevelopment project area in the city at large when our ability to have 20 percent of that tax increment flow be set aside for affordable housing goes away. Um, our success has been having that revenue source. So we've been having an ongoing dialogue with the California Redevelopment Association trying to uh, convince folks that there's enough redevelopment project areas, old ones like ours, or one of the first in the city, uh, in the in the state, that will be expiring, and the impact on providing affordable housing will be great. So we're looking at some way to potentially extend the ability to collect tax increment just to do the affordable housing. Right. So that so the maintenance of effort piece, which I think is what Paul's talking about, and the and the business about the. Um, uh, housing, affordable housing subsidies, subsidies, the other piece. The, que the question I have then is, what are the, what's sort of the legal parameters for us in terms of uh, how we, how we engage with that and how we move forward? Are we prohibited from, from discussing that, or is it something we can go after robustly as a, as an agency and, and to begin to work on? Madam Mayor, well, Council Member House, uh, yeah. just to add what uh, Mr. Gustafson and, and Mr. Casey mentioned, which I, I fully agree with. I mean, it, it's, it's complicated. One thing I want to mention, and I really think we should keep in mind, there, there's a real tendency, a natural tendency, to say the agency is ending in 2015. Well, in fact, the agency is not ending. The agency is a corporate entity. Corporate entities don't end until the board of directors of that entity decide that they end. Mm. What is ending it's is the, the tax increment yeah. funding. Now, so really there's that logical connection. What's the good of a corporation if it has no funding? Mm. Uh, but that's where it gets complicated. We do have the funding to continue our debt service beyond 2015. You know, those of us like Mr. Gustafson and I and, and others who have been involved in redevelopment for years and years have just seen this evolution. And what what's happened is that the state keeps coming at redevelopment agencies. And to, to those, particularly in Santa Barbara, where we were developing so many good pure redevelopment projects, housing projects, we just always scratch on our head why the state was making runs at redevelopment and accusing redevelopment agencies of abuse. And I, some of it was legitimate, but Mr. Gu for example, Mr. Gustafson mentioned this total tax increment cap of I think it's 413 million that we're going to run up against. That actually was not in our original plan. That was a requirement from 1986 that Sacramento forced on all redevelopment agencies in you know in six months or by July 1, 1986, we want you all to adopt a total tax increment cap on the amount of increment you will ever collect. Well, in 1986, when we adopted that cap, our, our plan was set to expire in the year, last year, 2006. And so it made sense at the time. It, the finance director worked it up, and it was a logical progression by percentage. But then, then I think every year since 86, Sacramento, not every year, but every other year since 86, Sacramento has made a run at redevelopment agencies. You have to have a total cap. You have to have a date by which you will issue all your debt, and thereafter you can't do any more debt. You have to have a limit on your power of eminent domain. You have to have uh, all of these. You, uh, you can't adopt new project areas. And uh, we're dealing with these Sacramento being down on redevelopment. And I guess just to get to my point, I, I think the questions you're asking really have to do with talking to our state representatives and saying, you know, I, I don't know, we don't know about other cities, but in Santa Barbara, redevelopment has been a tremendous benefit, both uh, for, for uh, commercial development, both for proper urban development within the city and for affordable housing. And, and just to give you an example of how this uh, sort of thing can work out, Dave may, I know Dave remembers this, in, in about early 2001 or 2002, we were looking at the, the new legislation that, that prevented 
further indebtedness beyond 2003. And it wasn't clear whether it applied to housing projects or not, but it apparently did. And so we talked to our bond council, Orr, Carrington, and Sutcliffe, who are very in tune to these things and very connected in Sacramento with making valid redevelopment points to Sacramento. And we were able to change that. And I mean, I think I understood at the time Sacramento or Santa Barbara and Ora Carrington were really the leaders in this in getting a change in the legislation to make it clear that the limit on indebtedness, the time limit, did not apply to housing indebtedness. I consider that a big thing. Mm -hmm. And, and I, 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 I'm be hard pressed to say why Sacramento would now tell, should now tell cities and counties that liberalizing some of the things that they have adopted in recent years with respect to affordable housing is not a good idea. But to conclude, the agency is not going to end. Uh, we just need to think about different ways. That, you know, the, the chart showed what, what little ongoing revenues outside of tax increment the agency actually has. And finally, you know, the Redevelopment Act was first adopted in 1953. And charter cities have been around since California has been around. And the concept of uh, eliminating blight and the concept of the need for redevelopment predates the Redevelopment Act. It is a municipal affair. So there is nothing that, uh, clearly nothing inappropriate for a charter city and a charter city council to say, well, we are going to do things that foster redevelopment, or perhaps we're going to keep our redevelopment agency as a body, and because that'll keep our focus on redevelopment or on affordable housing. Yeah. Thank you so much for that answer, uh, all three of you. I really do appreciate that, and I think that this is, uh, uh, I, I, I firmly believe this is a council who would like to you know, roll up the sleeves and get to work on this as soon as you feel that we can you know, make headway. So thank you very much. Okay, Ms. Fakoni. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, building on that just a little bit, um, I do believe, I've lost track of them, but I do believe, Mr. Gustafson, that there are at least two, possibly more bills sort of floating through the legislature at this point. I don't know where they are. I don't know what the status is, but it seemed to me that the predominant sentiment was to allow those folks who have redevelopment agencies that have successfully sort of completed their missions in terms of what it was meant to, and there's a lot of abuse out there uh, for in, in, in various other jurisdictions. So I understand, to some extent, the state coming down on RDA uh, as a whole, although I, you know, <clears throat> will reserve the rest of my comments about the state. Um, but I do believe that there are a couple of, of possibly helpful bills running around. Maybe you could talk to us a little bit about that. But also... Um, the uh, plan, I'm, w I'm wondering whether or not this conversation, as Mr. House has sort of outlined it, uh, has any sort of place in the Plan 2030 conversation when we're out there engaged in engaging the community, letting them know of the, the limitations, not the ending, but the limitations that are going to be imposed now upon the RDA, the money, and and the various sorts of things we can do with it. So those two items maybe you could address a little. Thank you. Uh, you yes, that? thank you, uh, uh, Councilwoman <laughs> Falcone. Regarding the legislation, there's every year a small crop of legislation that looks at the ability of project areas to extend their life. The, the problem is that they're always associated with a fundamental uh, piece of redevelopment, the, the justification for redevelopment, which is fighting blight. And every year, it seems like, or as Steve said, every other year, there's legislation that sort of tightens the, the ability of redevelopment agency to do things and tightens the definition of blight. Uh, everything that we can see uh, about Santa Barbara suggests that we cannot stand the new test for uh, blight, for the need to eradicate blight within our project area. In fact, some of the legislation has now required you, if you're going to do extensions, to do redevelopment on a parcel by parcel basis and then prove blight for each of those parcels. Uh, when we talk about extending the ability to do redevelopment with Sacramento and with CRA, sometimes, in fact, I get the message back, well, you guys ought to be the paradigm because you're one of the older projects areas and you've been so fabulously successful. You could be the model for what, why a redevelopment agency has done a wonderful job and ought to go to sleep now. So there's that sort of uh, mentality that we're dealing with. Uh, and the bottom line, of course, to me is, uh, regardless of whether the agency exists as, a, as an entity, 
the project area goes away. The project area is the source of our revenue. If we can't realize that revenue, it's very hard to do things at the same level of magnitude that we're doing them now. And that cap looms of $431 million that, as I said, we've kind of projected, think, we think we'll get there around 2018. Major plan amendment. At that point, if we do a major plan amendment, and the city attorney may, may need to correct me, but my understanding is we have to stand the new tests for blight in the legislation that's been passed since our agency was established and that we more than likely wouldn't be able to do that. So those are the constraints. What I'm hoping is in the dialogue with the state and with the California Redevelopment Association and the other uh, representative professional bodies that we might be able to create a legislative exception to the cap itself for affordable housing purposes at least. I'm less sanguine that we could do so for uh, our general redevelopment uh, activity needs. Well, just to let you know that in the last several years throughout through the coalitions of the League of California Cities and the Redevelopment Agency and uh, the county, uh, folks and you know some of the other major groups that are up in Sacramento the relationships are markedly different and they've been in in a coalition type of uh, type of dialogue on these other issues that have to do with eminent domain and um, the 1a and, and so forth so there may be a, um, a different uh, dynamic uh, on these issues that didn't exist before and Madam Mayor, Councilwoman yes. Falcone, regarding Plan Santa Barbara, yes, I think it is a, a worthy discussion. We've already been to the downtown organization's board retreat, Mr. Armstrong and I, and that was one of the issues we raised up is time to start thinking about um, what I say, the end of RDA, but it's technically not correct. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, to get in their minds that we need to start thinking about what next uh, because uh, this funding source is not going to be there for that much longer, and, and the time is now. We're going to have a follow-up uh, work session with the downtown organization, and they're even talking about in the fall wanting to sponsor something that focuses on downtown, and I think this will be one of the issues front and mm -hmm. center because if you're thinking long-term thinking, this is clearly something uh, to be addressed. No, absolutely. Mr. Williams? Well, uh, Councilmember uh, House and I were, were at a presentation earlier this spring from the executive director of the uh, CRA, and and, uh, and he was not very optimistic, as you've indicated, Mr. Gustafson. And I, I hope we can change the political climate um, in the long run that, that, that California cities are. But it's an uphill climb because... Um, while we might have a good record, most cities have terrible records uh, of not using the 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 twenty percent increment for affordable housing, of um, you know spending things on you know maybe projects that have marginal use in addressing blight, uh, in doing switcheroos with operating funds and stuff like that. You know that um, uh, I think that uh, hopefully we will set the best example possible. Um, the other issue is, I think, in workforce is workforce housing. If if that's pretty much if that nine million is what we have left, and we have those four projects, I really hope that we will uh, put a workforce housing com component in one of them. And if that doesn't end up being the transit village, then I'd really like to know from staff wh where we're going to do it, because um, we're we've done a really good job of addressing capital A affordable housing. Um, but middle class housing is really Im important to address. We can't do that with the capital A affordable 20%, but the only other big pot of money that we have to, to deal with workforce housing is the, is, uh, RDA fu the, is the rest of the RDA funds, the 80% the fund 111. Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Williams, uh, by, as, by workforce housing, you're meaning housing above the low and moderate income category. We have sometimes a nomenclature confusion here because sometimes right. we refer to workforce housing I'm just as that to category. For the audience. Some other jurisdictions talk about it, uh, downtown worker housing. Uh, downtown worker housing, I would, would fully expect, would be a, a portion of what you'll see in the RFP for you to consider on the Transit Village. The two projects on the east side and the west side or the west downtown, both would have uh, downtown worker components. None of them propose workforce by our definition of workforce. So those are 
the, that's a category of housing that we can't use, as you pointed out, the RDA housing set aside money for. We could use some RDA general funds for a project that had workforce housing if it also included low and moderate income housing or it had some reason uh, as a commercial development to uh, be built to help fight blight and that sort of thing. Challenging, but something that we can continue to look, look at as projects come forward. And the potential for some of that in the transit village project really depending on what can, how many people's desires can be accommodated in the envelope of size, bulk, and scale that we have. Yeah, I, I just feel like if that's, if we're not going to do that, Los Portales is, is important, but I mean, it's a drop in the in the bucket in the, in the long run, and in those, in those there is uh, a limited amount of uh, land within the the agency, and and those those places within the agency is only, are the only places where we can. Uh, I'm I'm not talking about using RDA for Los Portales. I'm talking about using redevelopment agency for workforce housing, which is possible within the project area. And we need to, you know, identify while we ha still have some sites where we can do that. Um, so okay. that's just something I feel real strongly about. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Casey. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll wrap up here with a few additional items. First, our performance measurement. I thought I would focus on uh, our green or sustainability items. You, you've got the document that includes all of our performance measurements, and we're here and happy to answer any questions, but just kind of highlight some of the issues on this new focus that we have as an organization. Um, within administration, we're looking at our use of city fleet vehicles. Uh, we're going to eliminate one of our cars, uh, which does not have a lot of mileage on it, but has been around for years, and so we don't think we need it, and so let's get rid of it. And then also a pretty innovative idea with the Public Works Department, who we share the building with, of kind of pooling our pool cars in the back, our, our e-cars, and creating some sort of electronic reservation system so that we can eliminate the overall number and use our, our fleet more efficiently and more effectively that way. So we're pretty excited about doing that, and we think that that will reduce the overall number of cars that uh, we need to have out there. And then also, I think you're aware, we need to redo the second story floor uh, at 630 Garden Street. And so we're having a focus on using the green materials of new carpeting, paint, and, and the cubicles that we bring in uh, as part of that. And I also want to beg understanding of the community and, and the development community when we need to move out for two months. We're going to need to move over into trailers next to 630 Garden Street. But it's going to be inconvenient and hard on staff, and we'll do the best we can to, to make it sure. work. But uh, that most likely will be occurring during August and September of this coming summer. Economic development, these are essentially the mayor's quarterly breakfasts that uh, she hosts along with council members in, in different uh, segments of the community. Those are all zero waste events and those have been very successful and uh, the whole city organization is really moving towards zero waste events for all of its major events. Rental housing mediation, a lot of what it does is get information out and historically those have been paper pamphlets and so we're moving towards more electronic delivery of that information. Uh, and then also incorporating energy saving retrofits in our housing rehab loan program. Uh, just jumping down, the, the long range planning and special studies and, and the building and safety, we're trying to train and get lead uh, certified staff on board. And so we're looking at at least a minimum of two in our building and safety division and two in our planning division so that uh, we have that in-house expertise and knowledge. And as you know, we also do expedited plan checking for uh, projects that have lead certification. So having that expertise in-house will help us in expediting that plan checking. We're also investigating the ability to, to post site plans and floor plans and elevations on our website uh, for planning commission and staff hearing officer. We get a lot of people coming down to 630 Garden Street to look at that type of information. It's a little tricky because of the size and, and, and how it works, but we're, there is new technology coming out and hopefully we'll be able to get that on the internet, which I think will be a benefit for customer service uh, to all. Design review and historical resources, uh, looking at doing a, a training with our boards and commissions on green building design and techniques. Uh, you know, we have design review boards who do a fabulous job looking at the aesthetics and uh, looking at consistency with our adopted um, policies and, and design review elements, uh, but getting them more familiar and knowledgeable and understanding if they're not already on green design techniques and how that can be compatible with good, good quality design. 
records, archives, clerical uh, services, trying to reduce the amount of paper we have. You know, we need to keep paper trails from a legal perspective, but perhaps we can eliminate the, the second duplicate copy that historically we've used. We're scanning all our documents and going back and scanning documents and continuing to pursue that to reduce the amount of paper we use. Counter and plan check services. We're going to examine this fiscal year and do a little trial run at looking at electric plan submittal uh, for the plan check process. Uh, if, you, if you know, you've got those really thick reams of paper that submit uh, plan checks on. And there is new technology that you could submit that electronically. And perhaps we can review and do our plan check uh, over, over the internet and on our computers rather than having those reams of paper circulating through. And so we're going we're gonna to pursue and look at that and see if it works. And if it does, it'll take some money to get that up and running. And that might be something we'd bring back as part of next year's budget uh, if it looks manageable and doable. And as you know, you just approved a, a contract to look at the energy efficiency ordinance for a city uh, called the Architecture 2030 Ordinance that you had that coalition come and present to you. So we'll be doing that over the next few months and running that through uh, our process, but also through the state for approval. And as I mentioned, we're doing the expedited plan checks. Finally, major department highlights. Uh, wanted to just recap briefly accomplishments for 2007 because we got a lot done. Uh, it was a busy year and, and a lot of things kind of came to fruition and, and you, you felt it on your Tuesdays as things kind of came to you uh, for conclusion. Neighborhood preservation ordinance, I like to say, you know, on time, under budget, only took us... <laughs> uh, <laughs> but we did, we did conclude it. It, it. it turned out well. I, uh, but it is adopted, and now we're moving on to implementation with the single family design guidelines, which will be coming uh, in the next two weeks, and then creating the new board and getting that up and running. The Upper State Street study, uh, we actually did get it done in a year, uh, and that was a, a big okay. accomplishment and a good effort. The 916 State Street Public Restrooms, we just won a, an award from the Central Coast American Planning Association. Oh, and what was nice. the title, Brian? The Hard Won Victories Award for 916 oh, State funny. Street Restrooms. It only took 25 years to figure that out. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, Hard and won that was, yeah, on time and under budget. Uh, the, the Phase 4 State Street Sidewalk Project, you know, completing the renovation of the sidewalks in downtown. This was the last phase. Uh, there's a, a little celebration this Saturday, I believe, uh, to mm -hmm. celebrate all those phases in the opening of the Phase 4. Uh, Plan Santa Barbara, we initiated the public participation process. We uh, have the Housing Policy Steering Committee that has wrapped up their efforts on inclusionary housing and looking at a couple more mm -hmm. items, but that's been a good effort. We did green building initiatives. I've talked about those. We adopted some bungalow district design guidelines. Two major projects, the Cottage Workforce Housing and Veronica Meadows Annexation, took a lot of staff time in a number of years. Uh, those came to fruition. Uh, the St. Vincent's housing construction and the Santa Barbara Mental Health Project. You know, even though we approve projects and we think that's the end of the line, there's still a lot of work that goes on to get them up to construction and underway. And problems always occur that we try to get in and help mediate and resolve. Uh, but those are doing really well. St. Vincent's is getting very close. I believe they're going to try to do a tour uh, in July and invite the council out to kind of see the status uh, of that. And the mental health project is, is moving along well now as well. We adopted a tenant displacement assistant ordinance, solar design guidelines, and uh, American with Disabilities Act compliance review of city buildings got that initiated and going and, and some new focus there. So what's coming up for fiscal year 2008? Of course, the big one is Plan Santa Barbara. That's our general plan update, and we're underway. I just want to reiterate, we completed a Conditions, Issues, and Trends report about a year ago. It's a really good document. If you're interested in Plan Santa Barbara and general plan and planning and you want to know what's the foundation for the conversation and what are some of the key questions that we need to resolve, that's the document to go read on our website. And so some people say, hey, city, how come you're not doing more up front to educate the public about what these issues are and, and what our foundation is? That's it right there. It's really good, and uh, we've got a lot of positive feedback that it's a, a very meaningful and well-written document that people can sink their teeth into. So really encourage people, go to the website or give us a call, and, and we'll get you a copy of that. But it's, a, it's the starting point for the conversation that we're having now. We've been doing a number of community outreach meetings that have been very successful. People have appreciated us coming out and, and telling them what's going on and hearing what they have to say and getting that information. we got some really large community workshops starting this month. Uh, June 13th is the first one, but we have a series of four. They're the same four workshops, so go to any, any of the four. Uh, there's one on 
June 13th and then the following Saturday. Uh, there's one in the morning as well. Again, go to the website, uplansb.org. We've got all the dates, times, and locations for those four workshops. Uh, but that's a real major effort there. We'll do some community forum series in the fall and then bring back some policy alternative workshops, which is when it'll get interesting of kind of looking at what are some options. What have we heard based upon... week meeting so that the single family design board can come in is going to be tough and so that'll be a lot of focus over the summer implement the outer state street guidelines pursue the affordable housing arts programs the tenure plan to end homelessness uh, always updating the long-range capital program for the redevelopment agency implementing those 30 projects for the redevelopment agency is a lot of work the remodel of the floor various zoning ordinance amendments we're going to try to bring some packages to you to do some cleanup work uh, in that regional issues will always be uh, something that we need to be engaged and focused on and, and process improvements are always on our list of things to do and then the fun stuff the current and upcoming major development projects uh, you know there's still a lot hanging out there uh, you've got Hillside House in the Las Positas Valley uh, with an application. You've got the Cabrillo Plaza specific plan on the right property on Garden Street. You've got a number of Upper State Street projects that are now going to start moving through with the help of those uh, new guidelines and Upper State Street study. Uh, we've mentioned the 535 East Montecito Las Portales project. Number of mixed use projects downtown. Uh, and, and I didn't even have on the list, but we're going to do a major work session with you and the boards and commissions on height limits. Uh, both downtown but citywide and that'll be happening in July I think we've got that scheduled on your calendar and be a major work effort that kind of dovetails in with plan Santa Barbara number of large city capital projects the airport terminal uh, first and foremost and then we're just seeing a development activity on the mid state street area Milpas downtown Chapala it's uh, still a lot kind of working its way through the pipeline and we've shown that to you in the past that concludes our presentation wow. we're happy to answer any and everything we've got all the staff here to do and, your bidding and you're very busy yep. thank you thank you we have uh, some council members that want to talk to you about it uh, mr. house uh, thank you I, I, I concur about the condition trends and issues document that's phenomenal and uh, I've referred a number of folks to that and really hope they read it because it's really gives a good baseline I guess starting point um, we're back on a very seemingly small issue. The, uh, you mentioned the plan check, um, uh, re the time it takes to get through that, and, and the chart that you showed is really very heartening. Um, have we moved that in almost totally or totally in-house now, or, or are we still contracting that out? Yeah. Madam Mayor, Council Member House, 
I would say we're, we're predominantly in-house. We're still using some outside plan check services, especially in the structural engineering world where we need that extra expertise for a number of projects that are still kind of finishing up. Granada Theater was one. Mm -hmm. St. Anthony's Seminary is, a, is another where uh, okay. the school is going in and doing some work there. We do just now have a structural engineer on staff, uh, but he's kind of training up and, and getting used to our city process and plan check review and so over time we hope to have that almost all in-house so still using a little bit but not so much for the day-to-day -day plan check service that we're able to do because oh, so you, you'd mentioned time is money and, and once something's gone through the whole process including through either an appeal or having exhausted that time it seems like at that point we should be moving forward um, the 50 percent cost recovery uh, goal um, uh, kind of goes with that um, to what degree would that be uh, would an additional staff person, or would there be would there be some real benefit to to increasing our staff uh, staffing to um, help with that kind of thing? Would that be where money would come from to be able to do that? You said you've held the staff level constant now, even with this one change. Um, but it seemed like when I was on planning commission, one of the things that sure became apparent to me was that we seemed understaffed. Um, are we still understaffed at this level? Where do we need? What, what, what's our goal? Where do we really need to get? Yeah, Madam Mayor, Excuse Council me. Member House, that that that's a constant question for deliberation and priorities and balancing between the budget and staffing levels. Are we at the optimum staffing level? Uh, you know, probably not. And I think most of your departments could probably answer the same way. Uh, could we use more staff across the board? You know, yeah. The development review, heavy workload. And staff's working hard there. Yeah. But staff's working very hard in the design review section as well. And we never get enough zoning enforcement going in the zoning enforcement section. And to staff the development review section up, you really need to additionally staff the transportation planning section and the public works engineering and, and the fire prevention review. And so it's a complicated web. And so I, I don't think I can honestly say that, hey, we're fully staffed and we're really kind of sitting pretty at that level mm -hmm. but it then comes to priorities and balancing and, and budgeting and uh, you know as we raise our fees we've used a lot of the fee increases to add staff over the years uh, to the development review section and I'd say over the last eight years we've, we've been pretty successful through tough budget times of being able to bring in some additional resources but and, and, will, reta and retain them and retain exactly and but the challenge will be if we are, our goal is to reduce the general fund subsidy then future fee increases shouldn't go towards more staff but reducing the general fund subsidy or you can look at the future fee increases as maybe new revenue to then fund additional staff and so that's going to be a policy question that we'll have to have for you every year through the budget cycle about where we are and what our priorities are so I don't have a great answer for you because it, it we've got competing priorities of trying to maintain an overall city budget uh, with high workload but I, I honestly believe it's not only in our department but it's in other departments as well and well that's why I framed the question in terms of the um, uh, cost recovery and and if there's more of a nexus in terms of our uh, what we're able to charge uh, to what we're able to give in terms of quality of service and efficiency which are the two pieces that I think where you talk about balance it's not just to have more staff somehow it's to reduce the amount of overtime to be able to have the staff that you have be doing their job really efficiently and effectively and that the customer um, our, our, our constituents are uh, really well served and I would be interested um, when we talk about the budget next time around anyway um, to really hear those kind that kind of conversation about what, what's our what, what would be the optimum not like like too many people I don't mean that I mean right. where's that where's that perfect place that we should be heading for and what what's it going to cost to get there and I think that's in the cost recovery conversation and, and let me answer again because uh, I didn't mention it the first time the Finance Committee has been asking the same questions as well mm -hmm. and we did a chart for them uh, based upon just the land development team mm -hmm. what if we wanted to uh, improve the staffing efficiency and that's where we said you know not only is it another case planner but you need to look at transportation planning you need to look at public works engineering and it was about a six hundred thousand dollar cost to kind of staff everyone up equally so that you don't then have a mm -hmm. weak link in that process okay we just added an additional fee of 30 percent additional recovery at the time of plan check and that raised us hundred and twenty thousand dollars 
So you can see we'd have to be really aggressive on our fees uh, to get $600,000 additional revenue, which would then only maintain us at that 30%-ish recovery level uh, from and we're, and we're way low on our fees, and we don't have and we don't have the impact fees. You don't have the impact fees. So, yeah. Anyway, so that's, I, I encourage us to go forward with that conversation. A couple more questions. Um, it's really important that people people be really uh, well informed at the counter when people come and and uh, ask questions. That the answers they get are really good answers, and that they're not then inconsistent with other answers they get later. Um, they need uh, our, our our discretionary review boards need uh, good ongoing training um, in things like uh, the Brown Act and it's CEQA and who knows what. So these training, this training component is of interest to me. Where do, where do those kinds of things show up in our budget? Where does, where does okay. training, funding for training our staff on things like that, and professional development, uh, but also discretionary review boards, their, their ongoing training, because they need to be kept up on these things or we run into um, problems. Yep, Madam Mayor, Council mm -hmm. Member House, uh, good questions. We do have a line item for training uh, in each of our divisions that we use to support staff training. We also do a lot of in-house training. Uh, Mr. Cotto, uh, one of our senior planners, has uh, taken it upon himself to train the new staff with kind of a regimented program uh, okay. that we do. And that really kind of identified the need for this new position uh, to have a dedicated person who's really focused half of their time at least on training for the department. Uh, because we think it's more than just going to conferences because right. there are a lot of things unique to Santa Barbara. Right. And like you say, getting people up to speed so when they're working the counter, we're giving out consistent answers to questions and training staff that way. That's why we identified the need for this new position and do it. At the board and commission level, uh, we, we have some smaller amounts of money set aside for their training, and that was one thing in particular the Planning Commission said they would like a larger training budget uh, because we set aside funding for about two Planning Commissioners a year to go to the League of Cities Planners Institute, and they find that valuable and said it would be nice if they could go as a commission, mm -hmm. that they see other jurisdictions supporting their Planning Commissions to go to that, and so they raised that issue when we brought the budget to them as something they might want to consider requesting down the line as well. Okay, then the last two things, and they're very uh, small. One, one is uh, regional planner. Who's, who's, in, who's looking at the big picture? You mentioned it, and I, I agree it's really important, the coordination with other agencies, the housing issues, all that stuff, transportation. Who does that? You know, probably a couple sections do that. Our long-range planning section does that, uh, with John Ledbetter as the principal planner, okay. certainly looking at the regional issues, and then Rob Dayton as the planning manager in transportation. Okay, there's actually the job assignments engaged. with accountabilities associated. Sure. And then the uh, last piece is... Um, there's a tremendous amount of value for the community generated out of the efforts of your department. And I don't, it, it's, it would be maybe too much of a work effort to try to quantify that stuff. On the other hand, there is a return on our invest. This is an investment in our community, what you're doing, um, as is all the work we do in the city. But clearly, in your years, uh, each of these uh, permits that come, uh, that get approved, the development, uh, the development projects, the improvements to the the, the State Street environment, things we do on Milpa Street, the, the improvement to the business, the direct improvements in terms of people's ability to generate income because they have sus sustainable, affordable housing. Um, that's, that's, that's a big benefit to the community, and yet we always talk on the cost side how much it costs to do this, how much it costs to do that, what money we need to raise, what we need to borrow, the, all that stuff. Has there been any attempt? at all or any way to get our hands around or to be able to promote the, the, the value and the benefit of this tremendous effort that we just saw showing up on the screen and that we're talking about? I mean, it's, it's got to go into hundreds of millions of dollars annually. I mean, it, it maybe even more. I mean, it's just tremendous value. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, no, I don't know how to do it. Yeah, it's, weird. it's, and, and what I was it's qualitative and it's quantitative. It's, it's all of the Exactly. Above. I was reflecting and I'm blanking on his name, but the architect who just won the Pritzker Prize, which is the highest award awarded to an architect every year. I saw an interview with him, and he's really been involved in urban planning and urban issues and not just architecture lately. And he said the success of cities can really be uh, quantified or determined by the fact that people want to live there. People want to live in Santa Barbara. That's true. And so I think our success is very high if you look at it uh, from that basic term. And in fact, it's part of our curse as well, is trying to grapple with yeah. issues of too many yeah. people want to well, live Well, on, 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 just in a, on, on an economic level, the, the gross city product 
gross national pro gross city product is increasing and it's amazing whatever that might be we I don't know how we quantify it on the other hand the quality of life index here is pretty high too and and yet we have great needs and I um, I just think there's got to be something to the marketing of that the, the understanding of that from the constituents basis um, uh, especially because we spend so much time focusing on the cost side there is a return on that investment and it'd be interesting to know more about how how to how to tell people about that anyway that's it thank you very much there's a book called Metro Economics and I get it I think it's once a year maybe twice but I think it's once a year and it does list um, the economics of an area and what it contributes and that sort of thing but it's done pretty broad brush and I think you want a more specific plus we're always grouped in with Santa Maria so it's sort of like a countywide for us um, but we're we're like oh I hope I get the right number we're like 106th economy uh, in the United States and that so and, and that's New York Chicago all the big ones too and that's pretty good uh, and I think we're 130 something in the world which is kind of interesting uh, our economy is but what I'll do is I'll loan that to you that book but um, but I know what you're talking about and I think that takes that takes a lot of effort it's just, no, some when, when somebody but gets a decent stable place to live who's been right. having a hard time and because of our housing program and the 20% set aside and we can choose right. okay we see that you know at the increment I'm sorry the 20% increment. Yeah. We're, 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 we're assisting them in creating more value that supports their family, et cetera, et cetera. And when we do the SRO, get people off the streets, a stable place to live. On and on and on. Uh, each one of these programs, literally, the development review permit process, uh, even down to a lot split, each and every one of those creates value. And um, it would be a, a fascinating exercise. We should get the UCSB, one of their departments there over there, to take it on there. That's what we should do. Thank you very much. Sociology department. There you go. Ms. Falcone. Thank you. Very briefly, I agree with... Um, Pretty much all of what Mr. House said, and uh, in particular, we are the great beneficiaries of our success over the decades, but we're also, you know, the victims of our own success to a large degree in that so many people do want to live here because of the overarching community development that has happened um, throughout the decades in this, in this area, not in small part driven by the residents. You know, and uh, it's not government driven. It's really, it's really resident driven. Always has been, and I think probably always will be. And that's um, that's what keeps us, unlike others, where people go to work and come home and let sort of things take their own course. Here, there's a sense of involvement. And besides public safety and public infrastructure, community development is what it says. It develops the community at large. And so this is a very complicated, very overarching, uh, and very necessary uh, department that must function better than well. And it does. However, I know over the years there have been tremendous struggles. And I am in full favor of your raising the fees to get more of a cost recovery than you have now. Uh, clearly your budget needs to be augmented and if this is a way that we can do it then this is the way we need to do it and I think people are okay about paying their fair share the impact fees um, in light of the RDA going away and all of that is an interesting conversation that I'm of two minds about uh, and I look forward to that conversation but as far as the fees are concerned and their cost recovery for doing business I have no problem with you increasing them to 50%, and we'll talk about more later. So, but I, I believe entirely that your budget needs to be healthy so that you can do this work that permeates and is ultimately the community that we all live in and see and people come to visit. Um, the, the issue of training boards and commissions, I think, is a brilliant one. I like to see, I can't imagine it would, it would take an inordinate amount of time. I think it would be a little different from training professional staff members, but I think that some of that information, a lot of that information is, is useful because the boards and commissions are made up of lay people who, you know, 
may have some expertise in a particular field, but I think that it's, it's only good information to give them a better foundation upon which to, to do their work and to, and to give us advice. So I'm in favor of that. Other than that, I look forward to uh, Plan Santa Barbara 2030 and all the conversations that we have. Um, and of course, really trying to figure out how we continue with affordable housing uh, when we lose the 20% set aside is, is, is a tremendous concern uh, of mine. And I, I hope that we can also address the workforce housing issue, although I'd like to maximize as much state and federal money as we possibly can in these years going out in order to um, really keep the, the affordable, the low, and the moderate. And the middle class is a very difficult place because there's no subsidy for it unless we get a willing developer to put it into their project, which is why we did our inclusionary housing ordinance the way we did. But it's, it's minimal at best. So anyway, thank you very much for a complete review. Okay. Mr. Uh, Williams. Well, I think that uh, Paul, Paul knows this, but uh, because he mentioned the caveat, but I, I, I want to put a cautionary note on any idea that the success of a community is based on its property values and how, how many people want to live here, because I don't think that's actually true at all. Um, I find more and more irony in the term El Pueblo Viejo because of, you know, the term Pueblo doesn't just mean a, a town, it means the people, and it means people transcendent of just an upper class, um, or the working people. Um, and so I guess my, you know, philosophical question is how do we have a Pueblo without a Pueblo? And, and uh, I, I feel like that would be one of the worst places that we could head as a community, and, and we could look at a lot of resort towns uh, or Beverly Hills or other places that property values are high and say, well, is that a really a successful community or a successful place? And the, I think the answer is no, because there isn't the, the, the same kind of multi-class community that we still have here, but we're losing rapidly. And so um, I guess that's one of the reasons why I think there is a real urgency with using uh, those RDA funds and identifying other funds from impact fees and elsewhere to deal with uh, both our affordable and workforce housing issues. Uh, and part of that is addressing the economic inefficiency of having a development process that is largely subsidized by the taxpayer and is sl slower than it could be um, because we lose, we, we have an economic efficiency, inefficiency uh, there as, as uh, Council Member House. Um, indicated and I guess the question that I have is that you know we have to figure out when we just suck it up and deal with the expense of the whole land development team because there is an expense there there's also a possible uh, revenue increase that would happen if we can actually move the process faster so I think at some point we need to really look at that closely though I think this year is not the time. Uh, and I, I'm really looking at those impact fees because I believe that given that we have no revenue source for, for open space acquisition and we our main revenue source for, uh, for affordable housing is potentially going away, that we need to look at impact fees not just for capital but for uh, the basic community needs um, of of acquiring and protecting open space and of um, building affordable and workforce housing. Okay. Madam Mayor. Oh, if yes. I could just follow up, because I appreciate Mr. Williams' comment, and you're absolutely right. I mean, in no way do I want to leave the impression that our success, because we're such a desirable place to live and have high property values, you know, declare victory. Mm -hmm. um, not at all. And in fact, I think that's what Plan Santa Barbara is all about, is we have created a very successful town that now has new and different pressures that we didn't have 30 years ago, and how do we deal with that? 
because it may not be what we want to continue on that path and, and become. And also, it's one of the things I like about our department structure is that we do have the housing side and, and the human service side and the social side within the department as well, because that is such an important component to a healthy community. So I completely agree with your comments. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Schneider. Thank you. What a tremendous amount of work and a lot of accomplishments. Congratulations to everyone. And you make it kind of seem easy in, in a lot of ways. I mean, it's, I mean, the public the public debate's not easy, but necessary. But uh, but it, it comes through in the in the end very well and very professional. And I really appreciate um, your work in that regard. That it's not easy doing that, and you do it you do that very well. Uh, I I do want to talk briefly about the arts. Um, and highlight how much funding or general fund money that's going into community arts. Just in the uh, City Arts Advisory page, it's $571,000. That doesn't include the community promotions that deal with artistic events, and um, which we're going to get into in a minute. And that budget coming up is $1.7 million. And then on top of that is all the RDA funding that goes towards the arts. Um, I bring that up because in all the conversations we've had about sustainable funding for the arts, a lot of the communities talking about, they look at other age, look at other cities and they say, well, you know, some cities like Portland or, no, sorry, like you know, <laughs> Los Angeles or others talk about, they always put in at least, they, they have a 1% for the arts kind of um, marketing program. And, and they
presenting to you the Finance Committee recommendations. I do want to um, uh, note of <clears throat> that included in your packet today is an attachment to the agenda report. There's a memorandum from um, the Waterfront Department, uh, Mr. Bridley. And that is information that is being returned to the City Council in response to questions that were asked um, as part of their budget presentation to the City Council. And so I just wanted to note that we had res we were responding to the questions of the Council on that, particularly information regarding um, dogs off lease citations, um, increased work hours performed by hourly employees, um, and increased budget expenditures in the administrative division of the Waterfront Department. And so Mr. Bridley is here. If there are any questions on that, uh, okay. he'd be available to answer them. Um, if there are none, then I will proceed to the Finance Committee recommendations. Are there any questions for him? Thank you. It was very nice of him to come right back with the information. Mr. Williams? I, I would just want to be brief, yeah. and, and I think it's maybe something uh, to talk about. Um, another time because of the shortness of, of time, but I, I really feel strongly that um, with all the increase in, ten, in hourly hours that um, that that we should um, change the budget to reflect an FTE in um, one of the two categories of the increases. I, I, I believe that the, one of the large categories of increases is stuff that's pretty appropriate for hourlies. The other is something that I, I think would, uh, uh, an FTE would be possible and be appropriate, and, and I guess I'll just ask to talk about that at the Finance Committee at another time so that we don't use that time today. Um, okay. Mr. Uh, Pearson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, we'll proceed then with the Finance Committee's recommendations, and as the committee members know, and I'm sure the Council is aware as well, that the Finance Committee met um, uh, numerous times over the course of the last eight weeks, including uh, um, three-hour meetings each time. They began at 11 a.m., and so, uh, as I told the Finance Committee two days ago on Tuesday, um, staff very much appreciates the commitment of the committee members, the dedication, and the time they spend in reviewing um, the, the, the budget. And um, I'm very pleased to present to the Council their recommendations to you. And, and I want to start by saying that the Number one priority, from my perspective at least, and the uh, committee members can, of course, speak for themselves, but of the committee was ensuring that um, the city would have a balanced budget for both years of the two-year financial plan. And that really became a constraining factor because in the second year of the two-year financial plan, there was a much smaller surplus in the recommended budget than in year one. And so we worked very hard on how to address additional program priorities of the council and the committee and um, and still maintain a balanced budget. And I think that the outcome, I hope you'll agree, is a very successful one. What you see before you on the slide is a summary of the general fund's proposed budget as filed back on April 17th, um, the city administrator's recommended budget. And you can see that in fiscal year 08, there was a surplus after operating in capital, which as we all know is a, uh, a great achievement, of 300000 almost $301,000, but in year two, about $30,000. So that was the framework within, within which the committee was working. The first thing the committee uh, tried to look at was were there any opportunities for revenue enhancements, and the uh, we, we identified three, and the, the most significant of them was the staff recommended budget um, included an increase in parking citations of $3. The committee considered that, and after uh, reviewing information provided by the police department, is decided to recommend to the council an increase in that from 3 to $6, which generates an additional $265,000. I want to emphasize that um, whoa, that the increase in the citations uh, levels does not include um, the increase in the um, street sweeping citations. This is non-street sweeping only, and that's the general fund piece because the street sweeping part goes into the street sweeping fund. Um, in addition, there was a, an additional $27,000 of miscellaneous revenue identified in the second year of the two-year fund plan. Briefly note why we did not. Uh, tackle the street sweeping fees. We were worried about the equity, the social equity of raising street sweeping fees, which disproportionately happen in areas where there are um, uh, uh, multifamily neighborhoods. And uh, so that would be a, a, a citation that would disproportionately hit more working class folks. And uh, so we wanted to, to stay away from that. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Williams. Um, the, the final increase in um, uh, r uh, revenues was uh, the committee had asked if we could look at, if staff could look at <clears throat> the uh, facility rentals and event fees charged for the city's premier waterfront facilities and some of the private uh, parks used for private events such as weddings. And based on recommendations from Parks and Recreation staff, the committee is recommending an increase in fees for the Cabrillo Arts Center, the Chase Palm Park Center, and a number of the parks um, which, in which uh, private events are held. And those are all included in the memo from the Finance Committee, which was distributed to you yesterday afternoon, and includes the attachments, um, in, including the memo from the Parks and Rec Department. And, and in a minute, we'll talk about, well, we did a little bit, the parking citations. There's also a memo from the police department in the package. In all, you can see that the revenue enhancements for year one total 306000 and for year two, $333,000. And so that added to the surplus in the recommended budget became the amount of money available for uh, additional program enhancements. Now, the first of those for the general fund was actually a staff recommended adjustment based on um, the recent uh, adoption of the neighborhood updated neighborhood preservation ordinance, and which is part of that. Um, the council increased the stipends for some of the advisory committees um, from $35 to $50 per meeting, and um, that had not that happened after the uh, introduction of the uh, recommended budget, and so. Staff is recommending and the Finance Committee is supporting um, an increase to the Community Development Department's budget of $35,000 each year to fund those enhanced uh, meeting stipends for boards and commissioners. The meat of the program enhancements that were reviewed by the Finance Committee relate to neighborhood activities and youth activities. And the first of those is the Neighborhood Bike Patrol. And as you know, the police department has already re-implemented the neighborhood bike patrol, but they've done it from within existing resources. And based on information um, um, provided by the police department, um, there was some additional amount of money which would be required on an ongoing basis to support the continuation of the neighborhood bike patrol. And um, the committee is recommending an additional $100,000 in year one and $80,000 in year two to support the ongoing neighborhood bike patrol. In addition, um, we have uh, the addition of a one full-time equivalent grounds maintenance worker to support the uh, integrated pest management activities. Now, this is really a net increase of a half a full-time equivalent because the $27,000 is half the cost of one full-time equivalent. The Parks and Recreation Department is going to reduce their hourly salaries by a half of a full-time equivalent combine that with the new money that's uh, reflected here and create one new uh, full-time equivalent authorized position. Those two um, combined are $127,000 in year one and $107,000 in year two. And then the other large area was for youth programs and activities. And I know you have seen the memo from the Parks and Rec Department that includes the um, recommendations of the Parks and Recreation Commission, and that commission report and recommendations identified nine activities and programs which they had arranged in priority order and that they were recommending um, the city council and the finance committee consider funding. Out of those nine, um, uh, you see the ones reflected here, uh, one through four on this page. The finance committee is recommending funding for seven of the nine, the top seven. Now, of those, um, all but two of them are being recommended by the committee at the same level of funding that was recommended by the Parks and Recreation Commission. And two of them, um, the Finance Committee is recommending slightly modified amounts, and I'm going to go through those right now. The first one is the Youth Apprenticeship Program at $25,000 per year. Expanding the Junior High After School Program is one where um, we've modified the recommendation of the Commission slightly. The Commission recommended $40,000 in each of the two years. Um, in part due to um, funding constraints, the uh, Committee is recommending $35,000 in year one and $20,000 in year two. I, I think the Council is aware of the fact that the school district um, is reducing the support, their support for the junior high after school program by $20,000. And so 
the thir the first year funding of thirty five thousand will not only replace the school districts reduction of twenty thousand dollars but will allow us to add an additional fifteen thousand dollars to further expand the program and then the twenty thousand dollars in year two will certainly at least allow us to maintain the program at its current level and i think the hope is is that between now and the time we revisit the second year of the financial plan a year from now that we will be able to look at that twenty thousand dollar number again and see if we can augment it or perhaps if the school district unlikely as it may seem is in better financial condition maybe they will be able to return to the commitment they made to us to replace that twenty thousand dollar funding um, the third uh, priority is to eliminate youth sports fees and expand the youth sports programs and that's funded at sixty two thousand five hundred dollars in each year as recommended by the parks and rec commission uh, the creation of a summer fund drop-in program at Ortega Park, $13,100 in each year. The fifth priority was to expand the handball program, $3,500 a year. Number six, expand the summer drop-in program at three elementary schools, $20,500 a year. And number seven was to um, increase the uh, community services coordinator position at the Lower West Side Community Center. It's currently a half-time position. The Commission has recommended that it be increased to full-time. The Finance Committee, in looking at this, um, felt that um, at this point they would recommend that we would increase that to three-quarter time, which when you think about it is a 50 percent increase over what we currently have. So it is significant and the Parks and Rec Department staff believes that um, that is, a, is an excellent first step. If you subtotal all of the seven priorities for youth programs, you'll note that uh, it's almost $175,000 of additional resources in year one and almost $160,000 in year two. Okay, Ms. Schneider has a Just um, to, for um, the council members who weren't at the, the meeting, just to emphasize and underline a little bit about what Mr. Pearson said on the youth programs. One is we really wanted to go to the full time for the Lower West Side Community Center, but because year two is so constrained, any kind of salary increases we put in year one, we really have to continue in year two, and the funding just wasn't there. So we can relook at that at year two. The um, the second, if you go up a slide, the um, junior high school, junior high after school program. We thought a minimum of 20000 was because uh, that was the amount the school district redu reduced their amount, and we wanted to keep things whole in that sense, um, but also didn't want to just say, we're going to fund this no matter what, and, and really put the challenge out there in year two, not only with the school district, but with other outside communities. There's a lot of potential fundraising capability out there, and um, it might be used as an incentive as opposed to just fully funding it right off the bat. You might have a little more incentive in the general community to fund after school programs with funding that's out there. And we, we asked um, we asked staff multiple times whether we could get the type of service that the commission recommended at the forty thousand dollar level using thirty five thousand in the first year and then focusing on fundraising the second year and we were told multiple times yes we can so that was the conversation be behind the number changing around okay okay, okay. thanks yeah mr uh, house uh, I would uh, there was another priority uh, there's another item or two on the list that is not that are not being recommended and um, I, I yeah, understand there may be some news with regards to the eighth item on the list that's not here and it'd be I'd be interested to hear that was the one having to create a mobile recreation program yeah. um, and it'd be have good to have too. the news on that okay good Ms. Rapp. oh let me turn that one on there I'll just run up here. Um, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council Member House. Actually, as of today, the Park Foundation, I expect them to approve our grant application to the Santa Barbara Foundation for the mobile recreation program. Um, so our intent is to secure the funding for the vehicle and all of the equipment, um, and then um, we'll be looking at the funding to operate it. We'll be talking to partners. We'll be looking at our existing funding to prioritize how we can do that. But we are moving forward with that. That was, that's a really good, uh, good public-private partnership. Yes. Only public nonprofit private partnership. <laughs> uh, Ms. Falcone. Yeah, just on, on that, um, <laughs> as, a, as a voting member of PARC, uh, I saw that we did get overwhelming support from the, uh, from the PARC board to go forward to the Santa Barbara Foundation with this. I believe you said it was a 90 or $95,000 grant. 
the grant would the grant proposal the cost of the program would be just about ninety five thousand dollars what they'll find is still to be determined well certainly but we're going to ask them for that amount right yes we're good very good thank you okay thank you mr pearson thank you madam mayor excuse me we move on um, one of the other items that the Finance Committee was asked to consider was um, the requests from outside organizations. And we did receive, I think it was eight requests totaling um, over $100,000, almost $160,000 in each of the two years. Um, as you've heard in part from the community development presentation just uh, earlier this morning, um, many of those requests we were able to, the Finance Committee um, asked staff to look at each of the requests and determine whether there were alternative funding mechanisms or funding sources that would be a available to some of these requests, whether it be through events and festivals or the arts programming, um, but existing city funding sources and funding grant processes and, and staff was able to look at that and in every single case the requests um, that you don't see here um, were actually we were able to refer them to other city funding processes there was only one um, request from outside organization where that wasn't the case and that was for your information old Spanish days had asked for a 10% um, increase in, in the city support for Fiesta from $60,000 to $66,000 and, and that one item um, is not being referred to any other funding process because they are funded by the city as a line item. But of the requests that we received, um, and I, I would encourage uh, the two finance committee members that are here to uh, uh, also elaborate on, on some of the logic here, but uh, Casa Esperanza, the homeless shelter on Cacique Street, had requested um, money for two things. They had requested a, a CPI adjustment to the money the city already gets. That was actually about uh, t a little over $2,000 a year it would have been CPI. And as you can see here, actually the committee, because of some available funds um, in the first year, is recommending a more substantial CPI increase, $7,000, which is actually about three times the, the, the request of Casa Esperanza. And then in year two, a 3% CPI on top of that, so that would make it a 7,313 in year two. The other piece requested by Casa Esperanza was $29,120 in each of the two years for a streets outreach program. The committee, because there was a larger surplus available in year one, um, did agree to recommend funding for the streets outreach program in year one with the, again, with the uh, caveat that we will have the chance to revisit that as part of the mid-cycle budget review and, and, and evaluate the success of the program and, um, and whether there was be funding available for the second year at that time. The Santa Barbara County Arts Commission, this is the, as you know, the um, commission that awards our, our arts-related and community events grants. There was um, a request for about $18,700 uh, for to cover some staffing salary increases for um, the um, staff there, including the visual arts and public places position. In addition, they had requested um, um, about $19,000 uh, for um, and then uh, community development covered this as well. 6,600 for some one-time modifications to the hallway downstairs in City Hall uh, to make it into a, a gallery ongoing. And the committee is recommending the funding of that. But as community development mentioned to you, they had also requested about $11,000 to fund two annual exhibits. Uh, we're funding, they're recommending is to fund the uh, one-time setup costs and let the uh, commission help uh, work with the community to fundraise or to get sponsorships for the actual um, um, displays. And then finally, the Human Services uh, Committee had requested a 15% uh, um, uh, CPI in year two. Um, and as, again, community development mentioned, the recommendation from the committee is for a 7% increase uh, in that at $36,000. So the total recommendations for the requests from outside organizations at right around $62,000 a year. I, I want to clarify one thing up sure, there on that. The, the uh, Arts Commission 
Actually, that's to convert those positions to full-time. I think they're 80 percent or 75 percent, and there's, there, there are salary increases. The typical increases are in the county budget for those employees, just to clarify that. Okay. And Ms. Schneider has. Well, and to comment. piggyback on that, uh, the county's actually matching those funds as well to move it yes. up, so it's not all from the city. Um, so I think that money is like a two-for-one there if we because we did that. And just so the rest of the council knows, there were a number of other re um, requests from outside organizations that – while we did not fund it in this capacity, each one of them, with the exception of, of old Spanish days, has the ability to go to either Human Services CDBG or we just, re we just funded them last week with the RDA or they can go to the Arts Advisory Community Grant process. Yeah. So some, there, there is other mechanisms for them to get those kind of funds. Okay, great. Mr. Pierce. Um, and then in summary, if you uh, incorporate all of the Finance Committee recommendations and we update this summary table for the general fund for the two-year financial plan, you can see that um, in year one we still are um, um, uh, displaying a uh, surplus, a projected surplus of $209,000. And in year two, we are balanced to the dollar. So um, that is the, the general fund and the Finance Committee's recommendations. There are... Two other recommendations for minor budget adjustments to uh, two other funds other than the general fund. The first, again, was mentioned by community development this morning, and that is that we now know that our CDBG um, grant award is going to be slightly less than what we put in the recommended budget. So we're recommending a reduction in the grant revenue of $7,700 to reflect that with an offsetting reduction in expenditures to the appropriated reserve and to the single family home rehab loan program of some $5,800. And then in the golf fund, one of the um, items recommended by staff to the committee and the committee um, did vote to support it was to allow the golf fund to, and Parks and Rec mentioned this in their presentation, to allow the golf fund to complete their um, uh, course safety improvements over a more compressed period of time than would be allowed if it were to be financed solely through their internally generated cash flow. Um, staff had recommended um, a general fund loan to the golf fund to help fund that. And so we're recommending a, an adjustment to the golf fund budget to recognize the uh, proceeds of, those loan, uh, of that loan, $100,000 in year one and $350,000 in year two. And, and I do want to mention that one of the um, directions that we received from the Finance Committee was um, in, in, in their action approving to, or recommending this loan to you is that staff make sure that we look at the golf fund at the end of each fiscal year and if the golf fund does better than the projections, in other words, if they generate a surplus um, better than budget expectations, that we staff use that surplus to accelerate repayment of the loan to the general fund. And I will mention that this loan, of course, is going to come with an interest rate of 6%. So um, it's, a, it's a fair rate of return for the general fund, and it will allow the golf course to complete their improvements in a much more expeditious manner with much less disruption to the course and to the golfers and to the play. Yeah. So with that, uh, that concludes my presentation, and be glad to answer any questions that okay. we can answer. Okay. Are there any questions? We're not going to be approving this budget till the end of uh, – June, when it's 20-something. 20 26. 26, thank you. Um, but are there any other directions or any questions? I think it's really wonderful uh, how how hard the um, Finance Committee worked and, and got this thing done. So I appreciate it. Anybody? No, Mr. Williams? We'd, as, as uh, I guess, the most senior member of the Finance Committee that's, that's here, um, I, I, wow. I would like to... <laughs> Which is a strange thing to say. Um, I, I do want, we would love to, to get any input from, from other council members on, I mean, this wasn't an easy task because right. there, we, we, we went in with, um, I guess, a couple really tough uh, things to balance. Is one, oh, we very much wanted to reach a balanced budget. Uh, two, uh, we very much wanted to fund uh, the neighborhood bike patrol. And three, probably most importantly, we wanted to expand uh, as many youth programs as we could. We tried to look at which which programs could get some other kinds of funding uh, and adjust accordingly and, uh, and, and fund, for the most part, the ones that would not be able to get other sources 
of funding. Yeah. No, I think you did a great, uh, great job. The only, the one thing that I, I think we need to look at at a different time, not before the budget's approved, is the uh, reserves, our policy with reserves, and getting them paid back if that's what we want to do. And if we don't want to do that, we need to change policy. Uh, Mr. Pearson? Madam Mayor, um, as the Finance Committee knows, in addition to their review of the budget-specific items, they actually came up with a list of about f four or five, as I recall, items that were budget related but not necessarily directly re related to the approval of this two-year financial plan and and they have directed staff to come back to the committee over the course of the next four to six eight weeks with um, information regarding these items um, and one of them was uh, to bring back the reserve policy so that the finance committee can review that because that was established in 1995 and really has not received serious review since that time and 12 years later that's certainly appropriate and staff think so and and um, we will be back before the finance committee in the next okay. four to six weeks to commence that discussion good that'll be very interesting Ms. Falcone <coughs> well I just want to compliment you know all of the parties involved I mean this was quite obviously a very large effort uh, that involved so many of the of the departments and and Mr. Pearson, your office working diligently to to really work these numbers in very very creative ways, so that it it did not punitively hurt departments. In fact, you know the police department is is getting back up to snuff, and uh, we're able to augment the programs and put back in place a lot of those programs that are so so important. Um, I know that there was a tremendous amount of work on everyone's part. I know the Finance Committee spent hours and hours, you know, going over the number with staff. But I think it really shows that when there's a commitment and there's a will and with imagination and creativity, so many things can be accomplished. So instead of just looking at the negative and, you know, the, oh, we can't, if we come from a place like we did this year of, oh, we can, in so many circumstances, there's a way to figure it out. And with the talent that we have on board in the city and the staff, it's, it's extraordinary. And I'm, I'm, very, uh, I'm very, very impressed that we were able to get done all of the things and set the priorities with the boards and commissions as well. I thank the Park and Rec Commission and, and of course, Ms. Rapp's department and, and uh, everybody's department, really, who really helped to do this. So I commend the team. It's a team effort, and uh, we've all come together to set these priorities. And I would like to see at some point this council actually pass a resolution that says that our youth are number one. I know we did this many years ago, but it may be time to reaffirm that and uh, to actually proclaim that and really tell the kids out there how, how tremendously we value them, and they really are our number one priority and uh, keeping the city safe is right up there too so thank you all thank you very well, much the youth committee is already is working on adopting the national league of cities platform and a uh, resolution that says essentially um, it, it supports youth and families and we will be bringing that in another i want to say a couple months maybe even sooner so so that's the way that is okay mr williams I, I also wanted to say that we we will bring that um, uh, back to the council that which I think is a important statement and symbolic but but this is really the more su substantive move I mean mm -hmm. budgets are, are moral documents and we are saying right now that when it comes to our our, our money um, that youth are our priority and uh, and I think this is the statement that that we're making today and with final approval of the budget later on this month okay Ms. Schneider thank you and I uh, appreciate the support from the rest of the council and, and it was a truly great dynamic um, process with the finance committee and I, I just want to commend that I think the three of us gave staff a lot of work to do um, I mean they already had to put the budget together and then we kept asking him so many detailed questions about revenue streams here and questions about so like Mr. Pearson said there there's a leftover agenda items about four or five of them that we want to look at again um, so this this conversation will continue um, I feel like if Roger were here he would say something to the effect of 
the macroeconomic the, uh, forecast of the city of Santa Barbara is such that we don't know which way things may go in the next 12 to 18 months, and we need to pay very much attention to that. And, and I, you know, I think that message needs to be out there, which was why a lot of the things that we looked at year one, because we could, we really want to focus on are there other resources out there that we can work with other government agencies or communities or foundations in terms of sustaining those programs into the future because government can't do it alone, the city can't do it alone, and um, we need to figure out how that's going to work. And a very little slight of, of change with sales tax or housing or, um, you know, uh, property tax will have dramatic changes in our in our general fund. So um, we just need to be very careful. And uh, so it's it was a fascinating process, and I just want to compliment the full team and, and the Finance Committee for putting the budget together and then all the different meetings we have and to be continued, I guess. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. And with that, we'll adjourn our meeting.